everybody, let's get this show rolling. Woo! Woo! So please give a warm round of applause to our two speakers, James and Burton. He'll be adding one more thing to my list of worrying about, which is hacking seismological networks. So please. Okay, um, now can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, awesome. <laughs> okay, guys, uh, welcome to our talk. Um, this is called Exploiting and Attacking Seismological Networks Remotely. Um, my name is Bertin. Uh, this is my colleague, James Hara. We are from Costa Rica. And we're here to share, uh, to share uh, the, the results of uh, our last research. So, okay, um, this is our disclaimer, first of all. This is not a typical talk. Uh, of course, it's a technical talk. Uh, probably it is the first uh, research of this kind. All vulnerabilities that we found has been correctly reported to the US CERT and they contact the vendor affected. Um, we are not responsible of the action that someone can take after attending this talk. Okay. So, hello guys. Hello. Is Darna? This is, okay, ready. So, who we are? Uh, the agenda for today is this one, so who we are, we already know. Uh, the motivation behind this research, um, how we get into these devices, um, how we find it. Um, we will talk also about the risks and the impact, um, who is getting affected by um, attacking these devices. Also, we will talk a little bit about the seismological instrumentations in order to understand better um, the, this research also about the internal um, deployment, um, deployments on the earth and ocean as well, about uh, network topology, also how we get into vulnerabilities phase, uh, also about the firmware analysis, um, attack vectors, um, post-exploitation, and finally we get into uh, some conclusions. And recommendations. Okay, so my name is Bertin. As I mentioned at the beginning, my colleague James, we are from Costa Rica, San Jose. Uh, we are the co-founders of the NetDB project, the Network Database project, which is a search engine for IoT devices. Um, it's a project that I started uh, five years ago, and then um, James joined into, into my idea, and we started working uh, very hard uh, from two years ago and the framework and the tool. Um, as I mentioned, we're from, from, from San Jose. Probably many of you know our country. Uh, Thanks. Because, <laughs> Thanks. because uh, it's a nice place to, to live and visit. You are welcome anytime you want to visit us. Uh, we had a lot of beaches, uh, not beaches. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so you're welcome. It's a very, uh, very nice place to live. We don't have army, so everything is pretty much cool and relaxed. Okay, the motivation for this talk, um, why are we interested in seismological networks? Well, uh, an Amirash attacker is not interested for, this, uh, for attack these devices because um, we haven't seen a research previously in this field. Um, it's pretty weird. Actually, if you take a look in the Snowden docs, if you look for the um, string, seismologic, allosismic, uh, Snowden doesn't mention anything about it. And, and that was pretty, pretty, pretty much interesting for me. Um, who could be interested? Uh, and I think that governments, you know, in order to sabotage other countries' seismological networks. Um, this is a new cool and attack scenario because um, these devices are placed in string environments like uh, in the middle of the ocean or um, in the underground uh, around volcanoes and specific areas. Uh, you're playing with devices that measure um, natural disasters. So it's, it's very risky. Uh, this could lead to a financial, a fin a financial sabotage to a specific company or country. The vendor of these instruments doesn't have any sense of computer security at all. I'm going to show you. Remote access, remote exploitation. So all, all the things that I mentioned, um, power, power of this, this research, this research to, to continue until today. 
Okay, how we discover these 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 devices? So, um, how we discover uh, these devices? We have, as as we told you before, um, IoT search engine. So, let's see a demo about how we get into this uh, device. Okay, let me show you guys very quickly because it's not the main focus of the talk. This is the NetDB uh, web GUI or the web application. Um, you can uh, perform queries regarding our uh, query builder um, tool. You can search in HTML, IP, ports, URL, uh, HTTP headers, countries, SSL certificates as well, uh, fingerprints, um, and so on. There are, uh, there are a lot of options. So in this particular, uh, what happened here? Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. Okay. In this particular example, we are asking to NetDB for a specific IP address. Um, we are indexing. Uh, come on. We are indexing from this IP three ports. In this example, LDAP SSL with with the with the respective um, certificate and uh, HTTP server and HTTP and the port 80. If you take a look at the same IP address, another search engine very well known for you as Shodan doesn't have any results. Yep. So I'm not saying that we are doing a better job scanning the internet, but we are doing something, um, something that uh, they are not doing. We are using another strategy to get into the results. So we are focusing on get as um, many as data possible. Yeah. Well, basically that is NetDB, and this is how we will be able to get into the seismograph. Um, just looking into the HTTP headers labels. Okay. So um, as you can see, we have uh, a lot of fingerprints of the many devices. So one day um, we have done a lot of research um, thanks to uh, this search engine. We see um, a keyword, a very um, curious keyword. So we have another demo when, in which we will see how we get into this um, particular device. Okay. So. So let's see the demo. So this is NetDB in action. As you can see, I'm asking NetDB for a particular string, which is Taurus. Um, that string is available in the server label and the HTTP header of these two IP addresses. So you can see the fingerprint, JD, um, 5.1x, Linux, um, 2.4.24, NMX Taurus. Uh, that was uh, very, pretty much um, new for us. And I noticed when you connect directly to the, to the web server running and the port 80, you will, you will get into this dashboard. And you are saying something very unusual. I haven't seen many researches uh, about BNCs open in the internet and many other servers, but I haven't seen this before in my life. Um, I, I, have, I have seen many, many servers, but this one was pretty much different because it's giving you readings, it's giving you um, voltage on readings, power, and waveforms. You can see how the, wa the waveforms um, and there is an uh, option called waveforms, and you can refresh these waveforms each five seconds. So uh, at the beginning, I was not sure about exactly what was this thing. So for that reason, I started the research. Okay. For some strange reason, you, win, you, you find a unique fingerprint and millions of fingerprints that we have and we are currently collecting with NetDB and the public internet. So what is Taurus? That's the question now. So we have the web server, we have the readings, we have everything, we have access. 
and we can track them. So we know the finger, we know already the fingerprints, so we can start tracking them on the internet. But what it is? Okay. Um, what is Taurus? It's a portable digital seismograph um, developed by Nanometrics. Uh, it's a company based on Canada. And w when you take a look in the official documentation, you will notice that it's pretty much connected to the, directly to the broadband, broadband seismometer, which is called Trillion 240. And then uh, all the data coming from the broadband seismometer is um, routed to the portable digital seismograph and then the acquisition center. Also, it could be connected to a geophone. Um, these geophones um, are devices uh, that are placed in the middle of the oceans in order to understand better the sounds of the seismic waves in the middle of the, of the ocean. So, um, which is a seismometer? Seismometer are instruments that measure the motion of the ground. Um, they are reading the weight movements from earthquakes, um, volcanic eruptions, um, or different sorts. Um, from Wikipedia, we read um, there are different um, common applications like earthquake, detention, um, fracking, drilling, also mine safety, uh, structural analysis. So, uh, continue with the research. So, uh, we ask, we ask us, so for example, uh, which is the uh, organization to keep the standards, um, protocols, and, and all the rules to, to get these devices properly working um, globally in the, in, the, in the world? So, I found the International Federation of Digital Seismograph Networks. Um, this organization keeps up, keeps up to date the SEED reference manual, which is the standard protocol for earthquake information exchange um, in all the digital seismograph uh, worldwide network. So, um, these devices um, provide the real location, just connecting directly to the uh, web server. Uh, as you can see, you can go to the timing option and, and you will notice that and the location area is providing to you the latitude and the longitude and altitude uh, according to their, their exact um, location somewhere in the world. So there is a, uh, uh, a demo showing you how we, can, how we were able to find a seismograph in the middle of the ocean. So let's take, let's take this, this, this data from this um, real production seismograph and let's uh, ask to Google uh, for this uh, location. And you will notice that it's placed in a, a very cool area. So let's go to Google. Put the uh, exact location. Um, and there you go. It's placed in the middle of the ocean in Europe um, between UK, uh, Norway, and Denmark. So, so we said, well, this is cool because uh, this device is, is running in an autonomous way in the middle of the ocean. So uh, let's attack this thing. So it's pretty cool because I haven't seen someone exploiting something in the middle of the ocean. So let's do it. You know? Okay, uh, NetDB is giving us uh, not their exact location because we are using the MaxMine uh, databases in order to um, query uh, the exact location of all IP address that we found every second. But it's pretty much accurate because it's telling us, well, your device is located in some ISP in the UK. So uh, this is another example of how you can use um, Google Street View in order to query the same information. And we found this seismograph located in Marlowe, Oklahoma, 
is this the same one here? This is the, the, the coordinates. And as seen to Google, so it's telling us, well, it's inside that property. But uh, Google uh, Street View doesn't have access to property, so you are not be able to, to get into, into more inside the property, but it's in there. So it's pretty cool. So which is the impact? Uh, I was looking for the uh, real impact in the real world. Um, so first of all, um, no one else has ever done, as we told before, uh, research security about this uh, field. So um, we know that we know that we know this that we can perform a denial of service. Also, we can take advantage of the web server applications. Um, um, then we get into the web application vulnerabilities. We see that there are several uh, bugs um, this for information disclosure in the web application that is using, as we said, a JETI server. Also, there can be lead um, economic impact for oil and gas research of a specific company. Um, there are other fields like a military industry and unknown areas. Yeah. Okay. Um, another company which is called PGS, um, they sell these components or these networks in order to perform ga gas and oil recovery. Um, so this this catch my this ca this catch my attention because uh, you can see that uh, there are lower applications for for this technology, uh, just not uh, for earthquake detection or um, air, earth uh, understanding. So vendors found in this research uh, good old systems, uh, GWL instruments, Zara, uh, also. There are other vendors, but the most affected is Nanometrics, which uh, claims that they are the world leader in seismological instrument and networks. Uh, also, you can take a look in Google uh, for white papers regarding instrumentation and earthquake seismology in order to understand better how these devices work, because it's pretty much uh, science, a science field. So no one, no, no, it's not very familiar for us as security researchers. So it was pretty much difficult to me to understand exactly how these devices work. So I had to request some help to our um, organization in my country, which is called Opsicory, uh, and they provide to me some information regarding how they work, and I explain to them exactly, well, I got a root shell here and this thing, so they told me, well, bro, we are screwed, basically. Uh, a lot of mathematics, a lot of physics. Um, if you're interested, you can you can take a look. This is an example about the other sees, uh, seismological instrumentation. Um, this is an example about how to use uh, geophones and um, what, what is the other one? Hydrophones. Hydrophones in order to catch up uh, the sounds from the ocean and to catch up the, the movements from the earth. But in the first example, um, uh, they are producing a fake movement in order to get into the gas and oil. So uh, I found a demo from a company doing this. And let's take a look how they are being deployed and how they are producing the fake movement in the earth in order to to get into the gas and oil um, sources. So as you can see, each point represents uh, a little uh, sensor. But you notice that they have a big trucks, and they, in some way, stimulate the earth in order to get the response and check, well, um, there is gas and oil, so let's dig into it. This uh, truck is collecting all the data from the network, and then um, is sent to the acquisition main center. So this is what we are attacking, each of these uh, little uh, devices.
So um, let's take a look at uh, how it looks at uh, typical configurations. Um, as we can see, we have the sensor and we have um, a key, um, the portable digital seismograph. So basically, um, the portable um, is the small piece on the left uh, top of the image. Um, we have the broadband seismometer at uh, the bottom, which is called Taurus. Um, which are the internals of these devices? Um, they are Linux-based uh, operative system. They have a remote management system. They have uh, several services like um, SSH, um, Telnet, HTTP, um, all the web servers, Jetty. Um, they have a really accurate GPS that can be um, used in future to get, um, you know, exactly location of the device. Also, they basically are made for ocean bottle deployment. In this case, the Trillium. Um, they have a battery that can make the device uh, be long time, I mean years, in the ocean. Um, in this case, we have a <laughs> sophisticated uh, image with, uh, in which we can see a horizontal sensor, um, vertical sensor. We have acceler accelerators. Accelerometers. Yeah, sorry. Um, and other layer for seismological and electronic stuff. Um, in this image, um, this is a pretty uh, expensive device, so we are not uh, available to get one. So this is a HD photography in, in which we can see uh, the several components of this device. Uh, so um, what about the deployment options? We have two cases. The first one is for the air deployment, and the second one is for the ocean bottom deployment. For the first one, as a stand-alone um, deployment, um, it's typical, uh, typically running a buffer mode. Um, it's not required a network connection. For the second one, it will work as a network element. So in this case, um, the user must configure the Taurus with the required um, acquisition server IP. So the Taurus will be streaming the data to the acquisition server using the MP protocol. That means nanometrics protocol. Okay, um, geophysics depend on seismometers to monitor earthquakes generated by the motion of the tectonic plates uh, that form the air crust. In order to function, the instrument needs to be uh, level prior to operation. Uh, that's easy enough for a device deployed on uh, dry land, but when it comes to seismometer placed in the ocean floor thousands of feet below to, to the surface, uh, the process gets a bit more challenging. As you can see in the air deployment, it's uh, pretty simple. Uh, you know, it's a, a small device and it's a um, simple step to deployment. But um, now let's see a topology of the seismological, seismological network. Um, before jumping into the ocean deployment, um, this is how it looks a seismological network. Um, in this scenario, we have three different communications type. Um, the first one is a BSAT, the second one is a ADSL, and the third one is a GPRS modem. So basically, the data comes from the sensor is sent by the Taurus to the acquisition server. Well, um, this is a typical ocean bottom deployment. Uh, they're using uh, autonomous underwater vehicles uh, as known as uh, AUAPs. Uh, this is a pretty much expensive um, deployment because you need uh, several um, ships and several UAPs and each of these um, sensors and digital seismograph has a cost around uh, $30,000 each. So it's pretty much in expensive infrastructure. Uh, this is uh, an example about how it looks like uh, the, the dashboard which receives all the data coming from the remote stations, in this case the, the seismograph. Uh, this is software provided also by Nanometrics, which is called Athena. Um, and it, it, it can provide to you the exact location and, and a nice web GUI. But it's not the focus of the talk today. There is uh, also uh, an open source um, uh, web server that can collect also the data coming from this station, which is called uh, Syscom Tree. 
if you are interested to take a look in the open source um, seismological technology. Okay, the challenge, as I mentioned, is pretty much uh, high. In order to function, um, the, these instruments need to be leveled prior to operation. It's not, it's not easy when it's 1,000 feet on the, to the ocean floor. So um, I would like to share, share, uh, share with you uh, a video about how this, how this is works. Actually, we had sound. No sound. Well, <laughs> well, this is a uh, quick demo. Well, well, no, not a, a demo. It's, it's just in order to take a look how these engineers uh, works in the ocean deploying uh, these devices. You can see this is the UAB, and that an antenna that you can see is the, the GPS antenna. Inside that uh, glass ball is the cylinder with the sensor. So these devices has an autonomy of uh, eight months. Also, they can be powered by a solar cell. Uh, also, in some cases, they can be um, provided with a long-term battery because these devices consume uh, pretty much uh, few power for their operation. So there you go. This is going straight to the to the to the to the ocean. Okay. Oh, that's it. Um, okay, seismometers capture a transient, a transient phenomenon. If an instrument malfunctions, whether it is at the bottom of the ocean or atop of a polar ice cap, the data is lost forever. So it's telling us, okay, if you can deny of service this thing, you will lose a lot of data. And what happens if you do the same with uh, 1,000 or 2,000 of these devices at the same time? So this could impact a lot the research of the, that these engineers are doing. You need to be absolutely sure that the sensor will perform perfectly every time. That's exactly what the director of marketing of nanometrics says. So what about the vulnerability research? Um, we start looking for get a shell of the device. So we start looking first for the firmware um, in Google and other source. source. But what is uh, pretty difficult to get it. So what I did was uh, look with my friend um, for the firmware using other techniques. So let's explain about that. Okay, so the, the firmware was not, was not very easy to find in the internet when I started looking at it. So I decided to send an email directly to the support, the nanometric support, and they replied me back um, 10, minutes, 10 minutes later, and they told me, uh, welcome, you're welcome, team, blah, blah, blah. So I'm going to give to you a an username and a password in mm -hmm. order to get all the all the documentation and, and all the firmware from us and all the software. Okay, so I said, well, pretty cool. And the same day, I started downloading and everything, the firmware and all the stuff available, uh, because they, they gave me access. I, I haven't done anything illegal here or something weird. It just was a simple email requesting access to to the firmware, and and they were very gently to provide access to me to that database. Okay, so there's the finger, finally. Um, is uh, that TGC file, which contains a lot of scripts and batch. 
So basically, you don't need to use uh, Bingwalk Bing tool or a finger mod kit in order to take a look into the finger, like only or, or like other fingers available in IoT devices. So I, I thought, well, uh, you probably you're kidding me because uh, there is a script called Taurus install that sh, which is pretty much uh, a lot of bunch of um, uh, batch commands. So imagine that you could uh, inject a uh, batch command inside that script and then upload it to the to the to the sensor to the to the towers and you will probably get a bug they were running always so nothing complicated for us okay um after 3 days uh they sent to me an email uh derbertine nanometric software software and firmware can only be provided to registered customers and i i do not see your organization registered in our customer database. So what is the serial number of the towers you wish to upgrade? So they cut me up all the access to the database, but it was too late for them because I already have all the documentations and, and all the fingers. So starting digging into the finger, I was able to get all the passwords, the root passwords of the SSH daemon, uh, the password of the web server, uh, the password of the telnet, FTP, and everything. And also, I found several backdoors that are not well documented in the official documentation. So, too much talk. I know uh, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty hard for you. All this information, I know, is pretty heavy. So, let's take a look in the, in the demo. So this is the shell um, with the default password and the SSH daemon. So who I am, I'm root, of course. Um, let's uh, ask to the system uh, the U name, and you know it's NMS, N N N NMX Taurus. Um, and after that, what happened in the middle of the ocean is the following. That's it. <laughs> well, exploit. Um, let's take a look here again. So basically, uh, now we have a root shell. We have the highest privilege on the system. We can do whatever you, we want. Uh, we have uh, busy box shells also. Uh, we have access. Uh, to all the system components, to all the uh, threads, everything. Everything is completely compromised after after you get the, the default password for the SSH server. So you can see there are a lot of profiles. So you can go straight to users txt template, and which are all the users in plain text. And you will notice uh, that there is something called factory which is not documented, and then central, tech, and user. Um, the password is the same for, for all the users, um, central, central, tech, tech, and user, user. And the factory backdoor, which is in, not in the official documentation. Um, this, these users are from the web application, specifically. So let's continue taking a look into the system file. You get the PSW file. So let's do a cut. Uh, more users. You notice that uh, the SSH password is not, um, is not in here. It was uh, in another file, but it was only available um, Unpacking the, the, the finger. So, so the password uh, was uh, Dolphin18 for the SSH server. I don't know why they choose uh, that um, 
uh, pretty much uh, innocent password, I don't know, nothing related to the system or the, or the field, Dolphin 18. So now we have access, a uh, user, um, a backdoor user, a lot of vulnerabilities. Um, let's test some vulnerabilities. And I wouldn't call this a zero day, uh, but no one else uh, previously uh, found this uh, bug before in the system until I reported to the US CERT. And actually, Nanometrics um, confirms the issue, but they told me, well, um, yeah, the bug is in there, um, you win. But uh, I think that there is no way to exploit this um, remotely. But it's in there, so, well. Uh, I think that an attacker with a lot of um, um, creativity um, can exploit this uh, remotely. So let's take a look in the video in order to show you how the bug uh, works perfectly. Oh, yes. So let me rewind this. Okay. There you go. Also, you notice that we have access to all the interfaces. So we can turn off or turn on, turn, turn, turn on the interfaces. So this is the bug, the shell shell bug. Uh, it's completely vulnerable. And that's it. So more bugs and errors, you can see traces. So here is an example about um, when we was trying to put it down the server jetty, um, we noticed that um, it's pretty easy to crash, crash it out um, with just a fuzzing technique sending randomly data over this jetty server because uh, they have, uh, uh, they don't have enough memory. Yeah, you can actually send, um, crafted uh, URLs in order to get these traces. So you, you will get a lot of disclosure information mm -hmm. uh, messages. Okay. So another vendor affected that um, we notice is Google systems, specifically in the SSL protocol. Uh, these devices are running HTTPS server um, with a full uh, Herbie, block, uh, Herbie bug enabled. And also, using our platform, NetDB, you can um, query the SSL certificate uh, for the stream Goral systems, and you will get directly into the Goral seismometers. So, um, let's talk about a little, uh, let's talk about uh, protocol and communication stuff. Um, um, these uh, devices are using SEED. SEED is the protocol, the um, data format, internally, primarily, for a change of seismological time series data and related mirror data. So the format of the nomenclature of the seed formats use four components. Um, the first one is the network code. It's one to two characters to identify the owner of the data. The second one is the station code, um, one to five characters for the station recording the data because it could be with several stations. Um, location ID, uh, identify the different data streams for a single station. And the last one, channel code, that is most important, will contain the band, sample rate, type, and orientation of the sensor. So um, if you want to know more about the seed uh, protocol, you can get into the reference manual that you can see on the web page. Well, this is an example about uh, Google Help Systems uh, deploys the yeah. networking mm -hmm. using uh, the screen server or something like that. Well, our attack now, we, were, we have a root shell, but we need to do something more. We are not just happy having a root shell and a seismograph in the middle of the ocean, so we need to do something else. So I thought, well, I have access to the protocol, I have access to the device, so let's do a man in the middle attack um, from all the data um, coming from the Earth and being streamed directly to that acquisition center. So my position now would be um, in the middle of the station and the acquisition center because these packets are not being sent using any type of um, encryption. There is no SSL, there is no PP tunnel, there is nothing. This, 
these packets are being um, routed to the public internet without any protection. Uh, this is an example about how it looks the packet header and the um, seismic packet. This is pretty much representative. It's not the exact packet. Um, I, I did just for for you uh, in order to understand better how the packet looks like. Um, basically, it's an XML file which uh, contains all the information regarding the latitude and longitude. And this is the, the main focus of the man in the middle attack uh, because we can modify in our proxy the latitude and the longitude. And this is going to be injected directly to the main acquisition center as a false data or a false positive. So we can flood the acquisition center with um, false data. Um, let me show you the demo of the man in the middle attack POC. Demo six. So there's the same thing, the same seismograph in the middle of the ocean, but this time, uh, these devices has an option called communications. So they can stream in an autonomous way packets to any specific IP address that you provide to them. So let's take a look. Let's, let's create a, a new profile uh, in order to route all the traffic to my proxy. You, you need to go to data streaming. You will notice that there are some profiles in this seismograph. Uh, these three main profiles, but we're not going to touch anything. We're going to create a new one just for the proof of concept. Okay. So let's provide uh, our IP address. And after um, press the apply button, this seismograph is going to start sending to me all uh, the information coming from the earth. And you will see, uh, you're right, the TCP dump um, running. This is our proxy in, in this case. And you will see all the data coming straight to our proxy. And what I'm going to do is modify uh, the latitude and longitude and then replace uh, our IP address to the original um, main acquisition center IP address because it's using UDP, as, as you know, a UDP packets uh, doesn't use any um, sequence um, a mechanism like TCP. So you can spoof the IP address and that's it. So well, um, conclusions, we are able to locate these devices anywhere in the world. We are in control of the device, the network and the software running on it. Um, there is no SSL in communications. Um, these devices have engineers to save people and understand the earth. And vendors, please go better and think in security about devices that help us to protect our people and the world. Yep. So recommendations, basically, um, think in security when you code um, this equipment. And, and that's it. Uh -huh. uh, in case you have any questions, just let us know. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs>